prayer right now. You may be seated. And uh, we have a couple things we need to be praying for this morning. And I would ask specifically so this morning for a focused time of prayer for our Hispanic congregation that's not meeting this morning. Uh, their pastor, Walter Delgado, has COVID. Uh, and uh, his mother is, has COVID as well, and uh, my understanding is quite sick from it. And uh, so we need to lift Rios de Agua Viva up uh, in prayer this morning. And there's others who are hurting and suffering and dealing with challenges, and, and uh, we need to lift them in prayer this morning too. Maybe that's you this morning. When you walked in this morning, you were acknowledging something, that there is a God who is bigger than you. And that's good news. Because any trials, any challenges, any struggles we face, God is here for. And we are not alone. He will walk with us. He will stand with us. He will uh, encourage us. And actually, he uses us to encourage and build one another up. And so, as we head into this time of prayer this morning, here would be my encouragement. If you need prayer, step on down to this altar. If you need prayer for a marriage, if you need prayer for a child, if you need prayer for your health, if you need prayer for your finances, if you're thanking God for what he has been doing in your life and you're celebrating, that is cause to pray too. We call that praise. So let's spend some time this morning in conversation with our Father. God, would you intercede for them? Would you step into, you already have stepped into, God, their story. Help them to see how you're already at work, God, in their story. Would you bless them? God, we pray specifically this morning for Walter Delgado and for his mother. Would you heal them miraculously? Would you take this virus from their body? Would you strengthen their bodies, God, and, and would they be virus-free? We pray for that congregation that's missing its leader this morning and, as a result, is not having church. God, would you, uh, would you bless them? Would you speak to them this morning in the absence of a pastor and, and help them to know how they can encourage and love this pastor? Lord Jesus, we are uh, so grateful for how you work in the world. that you fill in where there is emptiness, that you provide vision where there is hopelessness, that you strengthen your people, God, 
and give them rest. God, would you bless them and bless us this day as we open your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I need if you'd come up here this morning. As we begin uh, this morning, I'd like to uh, just share some things that are going on uh, in our lives right now. Uh, the last couple months have been a time of, uh, of deep reflection. And uh, during this time, I've had uh, some serious and prayerful conversations with uh, primarily Anita, but also uh, our kids, and also some mentors who have just treasured and valued their words over the years. And as I've been considering the journey that I'm on, and each one of us is on a journey, right? I've, uh, I've realized that there's a couple of stories from the Bible that are sort of shaping my thoughts in these times. First off is the story of Mary and Martha. Remember the story of Mary and Martha when she's with Jesus? She's at the, at the feet of Jesus. Uh, Mary's at the feet of Jesus. And, and Martha's running around, right? She's running around. Staying busy. Uh, throughout my ministry, uh, I've attempted to do things by my strength and by my might. Uh, this is sort of my default setting. But I don't think it's the setting that God wants for me. I think God wants me to lean into him. Uh, and as things get harder, my natural tendency is just to speed up and, and work all the harder. And that sort of trend has only been exacerbated in the last 18 months. The challenges of managing a congregation through a pandemic have taken their toll. Counseling loads have increased. Staffing challenges are routine. And it's real natural in those times, right, to run harder, run faster. It's kind of a natural thing for a lot of us, right? But I think too often I've relied on my own effort and my own strength. Uh, without going into a lot of detail, there have been some personal issues as well. We've been dealing with a, a former, uh, an issue with a former foster as we've attempted to provide some help for that person. And that has provided some unique challenges for us. Combine that all with the fact that I've been struggling with my health since February. And I've come to the conclusion that I need to step down as pastor of this great church. My last Sunday will be in two weeks, on October 3rd. BJ's not in here. She's over in her Sunday school class this morning, but Norm can attest to this because Norm had to, to hang around that lady picking on him for how many years, Norm? 30 years. She just picks, 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 doesn't she? But BJ has always told me, come apart before you come apart. Come apart before you come apart. And this is my effort. By the way, I called BJ to let her know this last week. I'm just going to share this, and you can, you can laugh. I called BJ, and, and I told her, and she paused, and she goes, well, this will be a good chance for you to lose some weight. <laughs> not kidding. And then she went on about your weight, Norm, so you're not off the hook on this either, right? Come apart before you come apart. The second story that's helped me over the last um, couple months is the story of Jesus. And I don't know if you, many of you know what Jesus did right before he started his public ministry, this, this moment where he starts his public ministry. Something happened right before that. Does anybody know what it was? He went into the wilderness. The wilderness is a scary place, but, but sometimes the wilderness is necessary. One of the reasons I'm doing this is that I do not believe I'm done with ministry. I don't know what it looks like going forward, but I've been doing this for 26 years now, and I've been around long enough to see pastors who burn out never to return. I see pastors who lose control of their life and have moral failures. I've even some, seen some this year who actually leave the faith, and that's not me. Neither one of those things is me, and I don't want it to be me. So I, uh, so I need to take some time and, and just be quiet before the Lord. Something I tell other people to do, but don't do it myself. And that's confession. As for immediate plans, we have no idea. Which is, in one sense, scary, but is in another sense kind of exciting because it gives God the opportunity to step in. I got my first real job at the Big Scoop Sunday Palace 
in Kirkland when I was 15 years old, 15 and a half. And I've never not had a job since then. So this is something new to me. Actually, when I was talking to my dad this week, he goes, you know, there's still a big scoop in uh, Mount Vernon. Have you considered applying? (laughs) In many ways, it's a step of faith. Me acknowledging something that has been true all along, but I have wrestled with. That God is with me. And God is with you. And this church is not dependent on me. This church is dependent on God. I just need to trust in him. Current plans are that we plan to stay in Wenatchee. I, I, and now, here's the thing, and, and I, you know, I, I get to do this all again in two weeks. I've, uh, I, I think I told Jeremy I've been crying pretty much daily. But that's a good thing. If I was laughing, that'd mean there was something wrong, right? You know, I, but I need to stay silent for a while, and that means for some of you, it'll seem like I'm oddly silent. Uh, But I think that's important not only for my health, but probably more importantly, the health of the church, because you're going to need to start moving forward. And my challenge to you is, and at the end of the service day, a couple of board members are are going to come up. There's already some plans in place. They're already working on this. They want to share with you. But here's the thing. My greatest legacy will be this church moving forward without me. And that means each one of you have a role to play. The church is not dependent on a pastor. Every church ever has had a pastor move on. The church is dependent on the Holy Spirit. And this is a chance to lean into him and do his good work. And the way you do his good work is by supporting the board. Um, In fact, I wasn't going to do this, but could our board members who are in here stand up? We have some board members in the service this morning. Millie's with our kids. Uh, But we've got some board members here. And these are people you can talk to during this time. They can give you some uh, uh, direction and and let you know where things are going. But this can be a very exciting time. You may be seated, guys. I plan to be still because I want to know God deeper. Uh, In a couple weeks, Anita and I will have been married for 30 years. Which is, and that's, (laughs) it's in a row. And, uh, when we got married, I was a TV reporter, and she was working at the Bon Marche. Anybody remember the Bon Marche? And during those times, we didn't have many weekends off together, and I started realizing this week that in our entire 30 years, we've had very few weekends off together. Uh, so I'm kind of looking forward to some weekends with my wife and getting to know her a little bit better. So you can pray for her. <laughs> And pray for us as we wait on God, prepare for a future, and step up in obedience. And step up in obedience, all of us. This church has a vital mission. This church, more than any church in the valley, I believe, cares for people outside its doors. That is our DNA. Don't lose that. Uh, My goodbye speech will be in two weeks, so I'm going to kind of cut this short right now. But I appreciate your prayers, and uh, it's an interesting time for us. But we know God is good. We've been here, some of you are going, well, it's too soon for you to leave. We've been here 12 years almost, uh, which is far longer than most pastoral uh, uh, periods are. So uh, we we have been so blessed. This has been a highlight for us. But I'll, I'll talk more in a couple weeks, so... Uh, thank you for uh, bearing with me. Does anybody want to hear a sermon now? You're probably just going, I don't want to hear it. Uh, but let's dive into a sermon. Let's jump in here. And uh, if you can, pay attention. I think we've got some good stuff here this morning. I, I have a memory, as I'm, and obviously it, it came to mind this week, but it's a memory that very few of you know of. Uh, uh, some of you know the church was in turmoil uh, 13 years ago. And uh, my family was lined with Nazarene pastors, and I was a Nazarene pastor, and I I didn't know, I knew nothing about the Wenatchee Church, but the Thanksgiving before they were, here's something terrible, pastors gossip when they're together about church stuff. Uh, That's the thing pastors do. My family was sitting around there talking about the problems in Wenatchee. Now, I wasn't near Wenatchee, didn't know anything about Wenatchee, and... and, uh, 
I said, around the Thanksgiving dinner table, I said, who are they going to find to go to Wenatchee? <laughs> who are they going to find to go to Wenatchee? And uh, the next day, I get a call from the district superintendent <laughs> of the Northwest District. And he says, Mike, I've got a church that I think you'd be perfect for. Now, I don't know what that means based on what I knew, but he goes, I've got a church I think you'd be perfect for. And I go, what church is it, Randy? And he goes, it's Wenatchee. Should get my mouth shut. <laughs> That's not the memory I have, although it is a memory. The memory I wanted to, 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 uh, to share with you is this. Anita, are you still in here? No, she's, out, she's out having coffee. So Anita. <laughs> she's just out having a coffee in the lobby. Good job, honey. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we came over for an interview, uh, and uh, our kids were younger, and... and uh, we left them at the hotel. John was actually sick, and we go to this interview, and uh, the interview was three hours long. Three hours long. And uh, during the interview, who was on the board at that time that's in here? Is it just Janine? Okay, yeah, Doug, you were there too. Um, they were talking about things in our life and ministry and things we learned, and, and uh, it was either as a result of a question or not. We shared a very, very deep pain we went through in our life, and we're pretty frank about it. Um, it is something that would, um, we didn't know how a board would take. And um, when, we were, when we were done sharing that little story, um, somebody, it may have been Linda Pusey, but I don't remember who it was, said, can we pray for you? So in the middle of this job interview, and, and for a pain that happened a decade earlier, they just gathered around and prayed and thanked God for what had gone on in our life. And, and uh, as I left that meeting that day, I, I knew, I didn't know if I'd be voted in or not, although I kind of thought the way this was working out, God was sending us to Wenatchee. And I was like, when we were, we were driving back, Anita and I were talking, and I said, I could go to a church that pauses an interview to pray for us. I could go to that church. And we came to that church. God showed up. Here we go again. <laughs> God showed up, and he was faithful. He did something, and he forever gave me the confidence that he would show up again. We're wise not to ignore our memories. Memories can be a powerful thing. They can be good teachers. Today we're going to look at a passage of scripture about remembering. It's a psalm written by a guy named Asaph. And out of respect for God's word, why don't we stand as I read this? Psalm 78, 1 through 11. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Things that we have heard and known. I'm going to switch back to... Things that I have heard and known, that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded to our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, those whose spirit was not faithful to God. The Ephraimites, armed with a bow, turned back on that day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. You may be seated. Psalm 78 is a wake-up call. Psalm 78 is a wake-up call. It's a psalm by a guy named Asaph. And we don't know a whole lot about Asaph. He is mentioned in other areas of Scripture as a prophet. And this is clearly a prophetic passage of Scripture. Uh, prophecy in the Bible primarily is used as a line, a kind of a, 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 a marker for folks. It's to say... This is what you are, this is where you're heading, 
And if you don't change your ways, this is going to happen. And this is clearly that kind of passage. He says, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. If you look closely at the Hebrew here, you can make a couple of inferences. For one, he uses this kind of interesting phrase, uh, give ear. That's actually based on one Hebrew word. And, and give ear actually means something more like um, uh, obey. Let me compare it to this. Uh, most of us, many of us have kids or grandkids. And over the years, I've looked at my kids and I've said, I want you to listen carefully. Now, when I say to my kids, I want you to listen carefully, yeah, I want them to listen carefully, but the words listen carefully actually mean this is what you're going to do. Right? And that's what God's doing here. He's saying, listen carefully. Give ear. Now, the second thing that goes on is this. He says, incline your ears. Uh, the word incline there in the Hebrew means bend or turn or shift your ears. Adjust your body so that you can deeply understand. And, and this is a call for the, the people of Israel to say, wait, we're going in one direction. We better change and listen here so that we can begin to get a better understanding of what it means to move forward. Do you need to change your posture this morning? Where are your ears aimed? I, I fear for too many in the church right now, our ears are are turned to our favorite news channel, which can oftentimes mislead. We would be better, better served to go back and look at the stories of God and remember what kind of people we are called to be. So first off this, the past provides direction and correction for the future. We know this in scripture, but we also know it kind of uh, in our own lives, don't we? that the past informs our future. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from things of old, things that have been heard and known that our fathers have told us. He's telling some stories. In fact, if you go on and read the rest of Psalm 78, and I encourage you to do that, you'll see several stories uh, from the, the journeys and the travelings and the life of the children of Israel that he recounts. The parables he's telling, some parables are metaphors, right, or similes, right? This isn't that. This, this, this is actual true stories from Israel's history he's telling. And look how he describes them. He uses this interesting phrase to describe these stories. He calls them dark sayings. Dark sayings. Sounds like something from Star Wars or something. Dark, dark sayings. He does a couple things here. He recounts these amazing, miraculous, powerful things that the Lord God has done. But then at a deeper level, he recalls the failings of his people who, after experiencing God's mighty works, made wrong-headed decisions and were simply disobedient. I love, I was, I was looking at Wesley's commentary, Wesley's notes on these verses, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, and he, he, he described the, the children of Israel God's chosen people as having unparalleled ingratitude and their stupid uh, ignorance and insensibleness. He was very gentle with them, wasn't he? He, he? he says essentially, look at all the things the Lord God has done for you in the past and each time you turn after seeing the miraculous, several, several years ago, some of you have been around long enough to remember when we went through the story as a sermon series, and we did this sort of helicopter view of the entire Bible over the course of a year. And one of the things that sort of stands out as you look at the story is this familiar pattern. God blesses the children of Israel. They're blessed. We're blessed, 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 blessed. And then they start to wonder. Uh, and then they screw up, and then they turn their back on God. Or they start grumbling when God is doing good things. By the way, if we're to be honest, I know this is true of me. If I was to look at my own life, I know that's true, right? I know that that is true, uh, that there have been times in my life where I'm just flying high. 
and things get so good. I think it's sometimes in the good times where it's the most easy to be disobedient. We need to reflect on the past, not to glorify brokenness, but to learn from it. Hear me well here. We're not to be called the people that, you know, there's some churches, there's some, not churches, there's some people that just wallow in their sin and like to, like to mourn over it all the time and tell others about it. It's not a place God wants us to stay, right? He wants us to journey in to victory. He wants us to journey into victory. And that's what he's doing here. Considering mistakes and learning from them, considering mistakes and learning from them is a pathway towards victory. Former U.S. Senator S.I. Hayakawa one time said this. He said, notice the difference between what happens when a man says to himself, I have failed three times, and what happens when he says, I am a failure. There's a huge difference there, isn't there, between I have failed three times and I am a failure. I work hard at never calling anyone a failure. We have certainly all failed, but failing does not make you a failure. However, when we fail to learn from our mistakes, that can set us up for all sorts of challenges. The, cha- the psalmist Asaph here challenges to learn from those failings, but, but Asaph's challenge to us goes beyond just considering where we have been. He, he's actually giving a challenge here to the people of Israel, to the church. And the challenge is this, we need to be storytellers, particularly with our future generations. We need to tell stories of what God is doing. Verse 4, after talking about these dark sayings, he says this. Because you know, a lot of times we don't like to share dark, dark stories, do we? But the psalmist says, we will not hide them from our children, but tell them the coming generation, the glory, tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established the testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments. We don't need to shield our young from the failings of the church. We need to point to them and say that's not who the church is. We are learning from that and we are moving forward. If done correctly, and I'm, I want to make that clear. If done only correctly, it is, it is not only uh, uh, good, uh, but I think it's important for us from time to time to share our, our own failings with our kids. Uh, a lot of parents try to shield their kids from their failings, and I think uh, it, it, it creates a wall. Whereas if a child sees a humble parent learning from mistakes they make, I can... It's not a huge number of times, but I can think of a, 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 a quite a number of times where I sat down and apologized to my kids for something I had done, either flown off the handle or um, stolen their snacks or, uh, or other things. And it's okay to do that. And here's the other thing. Our stories can inspire. That's exactly what Asaph does here. He shares the glorious deeds of the Lord. He shares the glorious deeds of the Lord. There are many glorious deeds of the Lord in Scripture. Think of all of them. I mean, if you're raised in the church, you've got this library of Bible stories that you can tell your kids. We need to tell our kids what God has done in the past, but it doesn't need to end at Revelation. We're writing a story of God right now in our own life, and when God does something glorious in our lives right now, we need to tell it to our children and our grandchildren. And we need to say, see what the Lord is doing in our midst. By the way, it's one of the reasons, JC, it's one of the reasons I'm so pleased you bring adults to tell stories, their stories, to our teenagers. I think it's profound. If you have a testimony that you think would benefit a teenager, It can be a health testimony, an issue of sin in your own life, how God has delivered you from things. Talk to JC. 
they're kids that can learn from your experiences. God's stories remind us of his power, right? That's the first thing. God's stories remind us of his power. In Scripture, we've seen healings, miracles, the power of God's creative ability, that he gave us this wonderful creation, uh, that we have him saving people from bondage. We see him creating the possibility out of impossibility. We see him love. We see him love people who are difficult to love. Where has God's power shown up in your own life? Share that. God's stories also remind us of his laws. Stories are a powerful reminder that God's laws are not primarily prohibitive, but are mainly protective. When people wander outside of God's laws in Scripture, what happens? They're damaged. So sharing stories about God's laws are good. They give uh, clear patterns, instructions regarding money, our sexuality, how we deal in family and how we relate to one another, how we treat people, particularly those who are struggling. And as we are wont to do, for many of us, we think we know things better, right? I mean, that's usually when we choose to violate a law of the God. We think, we think well, that's a good, good advice, God. You know, but in this particular instance, I think I'm going to do something different. God's law or God's stories remind us that violations of his laws rarely go well. Right? They just rarely go well. That's why dark sayings are important. We need reminders. But thankfully it goes for, for uh, further. These stories also remind us of uh, our hope. The passage actually says these stories are told to our children and their children and their children so that they should set their hope on God and not forget the works of God. So that they should set their hope on God and not forget the works of God. Even in these dark stories, and if you read the rest of Psalm 78, you'll see this kind of pattern happen. In spite of Israel's disobedience, God rained down manna on them to feed them. In spite of their double-mindedness, he was merciful. He forgave them. He restrained his anger. And ultimately, he even led them to a promised land, a promised place. 25 years ago, in one of the lowest moments of my life, after a year in ministry, I cried out to God. I was ready to leave ministry, and I was lacking self-worth. In a hopeless place with no hope in sight, God showed up. God showed up. He said, I've got this. And he carried me through one of the most difficult times of your life. Some of you may say, well, is that where you're at now? And I, my answer is easy. No, it is not. No, it... <coughs> Excuse me. I usually sneeze twice, so if I have to sneeze again, apologies. No, it's not where I'm at now. Why? Because 25 years ago, when I was hopeless, God showed up. And it changed me. And so when I get to these points, I remind myself that God is a God who shows up. Jesus himself said, in, in some of the most famous words in the New Testament, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Those passage, that passage I've repeated over and over and over the last few months. Now, it's, it's easy to uh, look at this teaching and maybe get the wrong impression. The impression could be, I just need to wait on the Lord. Now, waiting on the Lord is a good thing. It is a scriptural thing. We are called to wait on the Lord. But I think for many of us, we, we view waiting on the Lord as being idle. And waiting on the Lord is anything but being idle. A famous pastor from a hundred years ago, G. Campbell Morgan, once wrote that waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means, first, activity under command, second, readiness for any new command that may come, and third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. Both you and I are going into this. 
So I would challenge us not to be idle. We need to be coming to the Lord daily and petitioning God on behalf of our church and saying, God, what would you have me do? What would you have us to do? And then we need to act out in obedience. You see, the future is not all set in stone. We, our children, play an important part. Now, don't get me wrong here. We win in the end, all right? I, I'm, not, I'm not apostate. I'm not a false teacher. Jesus is going to come. Wrong is going to be set right. There will be no more sickness, no pain, no sorrow. But that doesn't mean we sit by and just sit on our hands until he comes. We are called in this imperfect world to show this world what the kingdom of God should look like. These stories are told, we remember so that we, and this is right out of the passage, should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. What happens in the past affects the future. What happens right now affects the future. The priorities you set for your children affects their future. Corey Ten Boom is a person whom, who I have the most utmost respect for. I, I quote her fairly often. There's a couple I probably quote more, but she's certainly in my top five. What makes Corey Ten Boom so remarkably is she was a young woman placed in a Nazi concentration camp as her family attempted to hide Jewish people, and she saw the absolute horror of war. She saw the violence that one human being or group of human being can afflict on another group of human beings. She lost her family in a murderous way. She could have been trapped in the past, but she wasn't. At the same time, she did not forget the past. And the past that Corey Ten Boom went through affected everything about her future and what she did with her life after she was released from that horrible death camp. Ten Boom said this. She said, memories are the key not to the past, but to the future. What we know of the past and Ten Boom saw that because of the horrors that she experienced, the way forward was to be like Jesus. I believe we're at a crossroads. I believe that society is at a crossroads. And I believe we are living in the most difficult times in my lifetime for the church. I am deeply concerned that the church of Jesus Christ is being pulled off track, often by voices that claim to have its interests in mind. Voices that clamor for rights and are less concerned for doing right. They are voices that scream with rage yet seem void of love. They belittle those who are not like them. They make familiar mistakes, detailed throughout scripture, repeated in scripture, mistakes that happen when God's people are more concerned with being in earthly power than relying on the Holy Spirit. Being in earthly power is not a concept we see promoted much throughout Scripture. But relying on the Holy Spirit is. In fact, I would argue that the Church of Jesus Christ throughout history has done its best work when it is out of power. The Church cannot be defined by hating the right people. The church must be not, uh, known for loving the wrong people. Let me say that again. The church of Jesus Christ cannot be defined by hating the right people. The church of Jesus Christ must be known for loving the wrong people because that is the way of the cross. And like the whole of Scripture, and really Psalm 78, it is about one thing. It centers on a theme that comes back over and over and over throughout Scripture, and that theme is this, resurrection. God steps into death and brings life. And we're living in a world right now where there is much death, physical death, spiritual death, and we need to be a people who point to life. 
through the death and mire and destruction caused by the enemy, often with sinful cooperation of mankind, God brings new life. So let me leave you with four questions maybe to think about today as you head home. What has the past taught you about God? What is it teaching you about yourself? What do you need to tell your children about the Lord, about the faith, about the world we live in? And how do you need to be more like Jesus? Jesus.